Hi, everybody. I noticed that a lot of people are probably not paying attention to a number of different things that have been going on in scholarship lately, but there's some really interesting things that have come out of the 18th and 19th centuries, and we've also noticed it even today. And so we wonder for ourselves, where exactly do our English translations come from? Where do most of our English translations come from? Well, many of them come from what is called the critical text. And in opposition to the critical text, there's also called the majority text. And interestingly, we have uh, discrepancies between the two. And some of the verses in our Bible in different translations read quite differently depending on which early interpretation or early text people are using. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm going to talk about the Johannine comment. Uh, a co I'm sorry, comma. I'm going to talk about that. I will also talk about very important verses that could have been omitted in the Bible. And I'm going to give a lot of evidence for the majority text. And much of the majority text was what was used for what they called the Textus Receptus, which Erasmus used in uh, to, to create what eventually turned into today's New King James Bible. And so the King James Version tends to go from some majority texts and the other Bible translations tend to go from the critical text, including one that I tend to favor for the Old Testament, which is the ESV. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. I want to say hi to everybody who's here so far, and hopefully uh, this is interesting to you. And so, oh, interesting. Why did that make that so small? So early New Testament translations uh, came from the Antioch, Syria, where believers were first called Christians in Acts 11.26, Alexandria, Egypt, Constantinople, or Caesarea in Palestine. So it's also called the Byzantine Majority Text. That's, again, a source of Erasmus's Greek New Testament in 1516, the Textus Receptus, uh, the Received Text. That's a Latin word, which is a text based on over 5,000 Greek manuscripts. And again, it's the source of the King James Version, which was first created in 1611. The Alexandria critical text is a source of most English translations, including two that are quite popular, the NIV and the ESV. And those translations, the critical text, favored two fourth century codices. In 1881, uh, the Greek New Testament translation created by Westcott and Hort, they ignored much of the Textus Receptus in favor of the two codices, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They changed the Textus Receptus in over 5,000 places, according to scholar John William Version. So what are the pillars of this thing? So I want to say hi as I go over here to people in the chat. Earlier I saw Doki Doki SFT Club, and I see, uh, I see Salvific Deputy. He says, hey, and Jason Lockery. So here's the critical text pillar. So again, let's, let's rewind on exactly what's going on. So in the 19th century, we had a really popular Greek translation of the New Testament. And this was based by, uh, it, was, it was from people who built on these pillars. I'll credit John Tors, who in a debate identified these pillars. The first one is text types. So he said, rather than looking at the 5,000 plus manuscripts, Greek manuscripts that we have, the critical scholars group them into three text types. So they distinguished what they called Alexandrian, Western, and Byzantine texts. As I just noted before, the critical text comes from the Alexandrian idea. The Byzantine is the one where you see the majority text. They wanted to focus on which is what they called the best text type. Interestingly enough, 95 to 98% are considered Byzantine. Okay. The second critical pillar is what they called the rules of textual criticism by Griesbach, which was created around 1800. I'm going to get into those in the next slide. The third critical text pillar was they rely on the Codus Sinaiticus and Vaticanus is the most reliable earliest manuscripts. So let me explain this. So we were able to find back in the ancient Near East, uh, what came from the ancient Near East, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. And these texts were used to create the critical text. And again, those critical texts were what was used by the English translators of many different versions of the Bible. 
if you want to see how important this is, just notice if you go to Mark 16, 8 in the new uh, international version, if you go to Mark 16, 8, you're going to see a comment that says most reliable early manuscripts do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. Now, I made a big refutation video that actually shows you a lot of early church fathers who spoke of words that were in Mark 16, 9 through 20. Things that were written far earlier than the Codus Sinaiticus or the Codus Vaticanus. So early church fathers quoted Mark 16 verses between 9 and 20. And so we have earlier support than the Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus for that text that describes Jesus's resurrection. Four, Westcott and Hort's genealogical method. The majority were copied from very few earlier texts. So the majority texts are not really 98. Let me explain this. So they only have the two texts. They have the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, which they primarily pull from. And they realize that we have over 5,000 Greek texts. So rather than say that we're going to equally weight these 5,000 Greek texts plus the two codices, what they say is they're going to put much more weight on the two codices rather than the other texts because they claim that all of these 5,000, aside from the two that they've identified, are copies of originals. So then they aren't any more valuable than the original. So they equally, uh, they weight the other ones much more. Okay. So I'm going to show you why that is a, a statistical problem. Another issue in the, uh, the critical text pillars is the discovery of the New Testament papyri in 1889 in Egypt. Some scholars claim the papyri align with Alexandrian texts better than Byzantine. Yet findings have not been able to pinpoint this. In fact, what findings have found, what people have found, scholars have found, is these New, New Testament papyri that they found, these early pieces of manuscripts, were on a wide spectrum. You can't say that they fall neatly into Alexandrian or into Byzantine. They actually cut vary quite a bit, just as much in alignment with the Byzantine as in others. So whenever you see two different texts, here's the, the critic issue. I'm now delving into the, the rules of textual criticism by Griesbach. This is what they have de decided. This is how they're going to figure out. So say you have a number of different ancient manuscripts. We want to find out which ones are the most valid and the ones that best explained exactly what was in the very originals. Since we don't have the very originals, the very the letters that were written by Paul, for example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, since we don't have their first letters. Everything that came from that is a copy, including Codus Vaticanus and Codus Sinaiticus. These are copies of earlier texts put together by people. So all of them are copies. And so this is what they said. They said, whenever you have two different texts, so say you have two copies and there's some small difference in them, how do you decide which one is better than the other one? So they say, let's follow these rules of textual criticism. Again, I'll give credit to John Torres for identifying this. If you have a choice between a shorter or a longer text, take the shorter. And according to this idea, since scribes are more likely to add than to omit. Hold on to that point. The reading that differs from quoted or parallel material is preferred. Okay, so rather than if, if you've got quoted or parallel material, say from the church fathers, this idea says that if we find something that goes against what those early church fathers say, we should actually take that because scribes are more likely to harmonize difficult passages. Third, the reading that best explains the origins of the others is, is preferred. Okay. And fourth, if you have a choice that agrees with theology and one that is more difficult, maybe in disagreement with theology, take the difficult one. The logic here is since scribes are more likely to try to reconcile or correct difficult texts. So here's the underlying assumption for this entire philosophy. The assumption is that the scribes freely altered scriptures. They took it upon themselves to change things, to alter things, to omit things. However, recent scholars have found that scribes did not freely alter the text and scribal errors were very rare and mostly from accidental omission, not from additions. We have no reason to give extra weight to Alexandrian more than this with the church fathers. I'll talk about this in just a bit. 
So if we value each of the 5,000 more evenly and apply statistics, vast agreement in the majority text gives us the best picture of what the original text said. In other words, we can look at all of these texts and we can discount these minor little letter additions, like in a lot of cases, apparently there's a couple letters here, be something as little as the uh, the word a eagle versus an eagle. There's a little an, a, it means no different. Uh, there's no different meaning. However, sometimes you might see the addition of one letter or something like that that doesn't have any meaning. But anyway, the bottom line is that if we look at all of these uh, 5,000 plus Greek New Testament texts, we can try to find commonalities between them. And that's going to give us the best picture of what the original text said. Now, the scholarship, here's what the scholarship says. So the big idea, again, just to repeat this, the big idea from number two critical text pillar by Griesbach, the big idea is that if you have a shorter or a longer text, you take the shorter, so the scribes are go going to add. So what they're positing here in this idea, in this critical text philosophy, they're positing that these scribes are just adding things. But of course, they don't have scholarly support. In fact, the scholars are saying, no, the scribes are more likely to accidentally omit. Here's what it said. The old rule is unlikely to be helpful to us. When assessing textual variation, it is more common to find that an originally longer text was accidentally shortened than that an originally short text was deliberately expanded, e.g., for example, out of a desire to add explanatory glosses. That's from Kilpatrick. Another scholar, Eliot, says, I would also argue that in general, the longer text is more likely to be original, providing that the text is consistent with the language, style, and theology of the text. To omit from a text is a frequent and easily demonstrable scribal activity, but to add to a text demanded conscious mental effort. The source for these two was James Royce. Royce continues uh, with a quote from Hernandez. Royce's dissertation has amply demonstrated that the evidence of the early papyri simply does not support such an assumption about scribal activity. The present study has found that the assumption is also without warrant for the fourth and fifth transcriptions of the Apocalypse in the Codices, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, and Ephraim. On the basis of careful study of singular readings of each MS, it is clear that the scribes of these MSS tended to omit far more than they added to their text. So it was an accidental omission. So these, these uh, assertions that the scribes are out there doing deviant activities are unwarranted. So has no one protested against Westcott and Hort and other scholars who prefer the critical text? One of their earliest critics was John William Borgian. And here's an example of what he said. He wrote a letter to a bishop, and here's what he said to this bishop concerning the later passages in Mark 16, 9 to 20. Now listen closely, all of the church fathers he's identified who linked up to that passage. Here's what he said to Bishop Ellicott. Similarly, concerning the last 12 verses of St. Mark, which you brand with suspicion and separate off from the rest of the gospel in token that, in your opinion, there is a, quote, breach of continuity, whatever that may mean between verses eight and nine. Your ground for thus disallowing the last 12 verses of the second gospel is that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus omit them, that a few late MSS exhibit a wretched alternative for them, and that Eusebius says that they were often away. Now, my method, on the contrary, is to refer all such questions to the consentient testimony of the most ancient authorities. And I invite you to note the result of such an appeal in the present instance. So he's mentioning people, this is anti, this is written before the Codus Vaticanus and the Codus Sinaiticus. Th these were all coming in years before those two copies. The verses in question I find, in question I find are recognized in the second century by the Old Latin and Syriac verses by Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian. In the third century by the Coptic and the Sahedic versions, by Hippolytus, by Vincentius in this, at the seventh council of Carthage, by the Acti Pilati, and by the apostolical constitutions in two places. In the fourth century, so now we're in the same century where the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus were derived. 
by Curitan Syriac and the Gothic verses, besides the Syriac table of canons, Eusebius, Macarius Magnus, Euphrates, Didymus, the Syriac Acts of the Apostles, Ep Ep <laughs> Epiphanius, Leonidas, plus Ephraim, Ambrose, Chrysostom, Jerome, Augustine. And then he went on to list a number of other early church fathers through the centuries who again have quoted verses from the final passages in Mark. Here's what he said. Here's how he concluded. And now once more, my Lord Bishop, pray which of us is it, you or I, who seeks for the truth of scripture in the consentient testimony of the most ancient authorities? On my side, there have been adduced in evidence six witnesses of the second century, six of the third, 15 of the fourth, nine of the fifth, eight of the sixth and seventh, 44 in all, while you are found to rely on codices B and as before, A, Aleph, supported by a single orbiter dictum of Eusebius. So what he's saying, bottom line here, is there are many church fathers, again, very early on, who referenced Mark 16, 9 through 20. They referenced either one or more passages in Mark 16, 9 through 20, way before Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were comprised, put together, okay, way before that. So why would we not rely on these early church fathers? Why would we not do that when they're quoting directly from there? Clearly these passages were there. Just because they were omitted does not mean, just because they were omitted by these particular scribes in the fourth century does not mean that they should be excluded based on what Eusebius said. He said, well, some of them were not included. Well, we've got, again, lots of ancient support for the inclusion of these early man uh, manuscripts. So why does this matter? Let me show you some verses why this really matters. This is very important. Here's John 7. Uh, here's where it might look as if Jesus is a liar, if you look at some of these translations. So the KGV, which mainly pulls from the majority text, which is the one I support. Okay, I'm not saying I'm KJV only. I'm a favor of reading um, uh, as many texts as we can and trying to figure out what the original text said. But here's what the KJV says. Jesus said this to his brothers. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. That was followed in John 7, 10 by, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Okay, but here's what the NIV says. I am not going up to this festival. ESV, I am not going up to this feast. Neither of these two include the word yet. Okay, so it makes it out as if Jesus is telling them a lie. Very interestingly, in some very early manuscripts, uh, even in the Vaticana, so P66, P75, and the Vaticanus all included the word for yet, that was translated as yet, okay? Yet, strangely enough, think about the motives here, the critical text editors omitted it. Here's another verse, Acts 8.37, which is included in some texts, some translations, KJV. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can also see similar translations in the HCSB and the NASB 1995. However, you don't see it in today's NASB, very strangely enough. You won't find it in the NIV and you won't find it in the ESV. Philip, after having read the Isaiah 53 passage, and to get baptized, this, this emphasizes the value of the believer's baptism, okay? And so it's been excluded from these other verses. Now, here's what's interesting. Early church fathers, Irenaeus and Cyprian, do include this, okay? So Irenaeus in 180 AD, again, way before the Vaticanus, way before Sinaiticus, says Philip declared that this was Jesus and that the scripture was fulfilled in him, as did also the believing eunuch himself. And immediately requesting to be baptized, he said, I believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. That's an against heresies, 3, 12, 8. Cyprian, again, before these other two manuscripts, in 250 says, In the Acts of the Apostles, lo, here is water. What is there which hinders me from being baptized? Then said Philip, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And this is in the treatises of Cyprian, Treatise 12, Book 3.43. Okay, so early church fathers supported the inclusion of Acts 8.37.
Here's Acts 5.42 for another example. And daily, it is said, in the temple and from house to house, they ceased not to teach and priest Christ Jesus, the Son of God. That's what Irenaeus said in Against Heresies, again, around 180 AD. Here's the NIV, says it, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, KJV, and preach Jesus Christ, ESV, and preach that Christ is Jesus. So you can see these slightly vary a little bit. That's why one reason I don't say I necessarily always pick the KJV, because in some instances, it doesn't seem to reflect the earliest tradition where we're proclaiming Christ Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of God. We make that really clear, but it's not added into some of these translations. Mark 3.29. This is interesting. The KJV says, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but in danger of eternal damnation. Now imagine what the logic is of somebody who wants to remove that little nugget. In the ESV, it doesn't say the same thing. It says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. That is not saying the same thing. In danger of eternal damnation is not saying uh, guilty of an eternal sin. All of our sins could be eternal for that matter. God forgives our sins, but all could be eternal. This is not talking about the eternal damnation. Notice that's moved. John 6, 47, KJV, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. ESV, where's the on me? Just says whoever believes has eternal life. Where's on me? We've got to make the, uh, we got to accent Jesus and the importance of Jesus here. Luke 17, 21, uh, KJV, I've always found this is one of my favorite verses, actually. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, the ESV and the NIV authors, apparently the people wanted to, Jesus said this to the Pharisees, and they didn't like, some people have, have hypothesized that some of the earliest editors of these editions, perhaps Westcott and Hort, going with the Greek edition initially, uh, perhaps didn't like the fact that Jesus is telling the Pharisees that the kingdom of heaven is also within them, okay? So somehow the words are changed in these versions that came from those. In the, the kingdom of God in the ESV is in the midst of you and in your midst in the NIV, but not in you. Notice that. Matthew 6, 13, uh, KJV, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We don't have that little addition in the ESV, the part where it says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Johannine comma. Now, this is a really interesting one. So in the KJV, uh, in the oh, I see a, a comment here. Let me just take a break here, take a look over here. I see Doki Doki, Michael Wilson. Hi, uh, Timothy. Good to see you guys. Always great to see you. So I'm so glad you're here, Jason Lockery. So here we go. The, the Johannine comment. Now I've got some good information on this. So so stay tuned. <laughs> this is really good. So in the KJV, it says, "For there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost." And these three are one. You can see right here, this is a reference to the Trinity. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Okay, so this is one of the contested passages. There are some major passages that are have been contested by people like Bart Ehrman in his book, Misquoting Jesus. This is one. The second one is John... Oh, what is it again? John 7, 53 to 8, 11, which is talking about the woman who was the adulterer that Jesus said, he who has not sinned, be the first to throw the stone. And that's a contested verse, although we do have early ancient support for it. And again, as I mentioned before, the later passages in Mark. So here's what the ESV says, uh, how they've translated. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. You notice here, we don't have the more specific that we see in the KJV. So the Johannine comma appears in 11 of 480 Greek manuscripts, and the appearances are later. Okay, so there's a comment. Most texts in the Latin Vulgate and the Old Latin have the comma, but here's some interesting things. So the oldest Latin manuscript having 1 John 5 is Codex Fuldensis, or manuscript F from the mid-6th century. This is a Vulgate version and does not contain the comma. However, Codex Frizing Ensis or manuscript R or 64 in the 6th to 7th century contains the full text of the comma. 
Codex Legionensis, or manuscript 1 or 67 in the 7th century, contains the comma with slight variation in wording, the Nestle Elland. Uh, Greek version, 2006. These two are of the old Latin versions. The Latin manuscripts with and without the comma exist from around the same time. Furthermore, Codex Fuldensis, dated 546 AD, contains the prologue to the canonical epistles purported to be by Jerome himself, which mentions the Trinitarian comma in John's first epistle. So here's some quotes that appear very early that are very similar to the words of the Johannine comma, okay? Here's what Origen said. Between 184 and 253 is when he lived. So here's what he said in Psalmos PGX 2, 1304. Behold the eyes of bond servants in the hands of their Lord, as the eyes of the bond woman in the hands of their lady. So are our eyes towards the Lord our God, until he may pity us. Spirit and body are the bond servants of the Lord, Father and Son. But the soul is the bondwoman of the lady, Holy Spirit. And the Lord, our God, is three, for the three are one. Okay, translation by KJV today. It's the next one. Cyprius says, this is between 200 and 258. He, was, he lived there in Treatise 1.6. The Lord says, I and the Father are one. And again, it is written of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. You see, again, the exact wording coming on very early. Here's another one from Athanasius. And this is between, he was uh, he lived between 296 and 373. And this is in his Disputatio Contra Arium. He says, but also, is not that sin remitting, life-giving and sanctifying washing or baptism without which no one shall see the kingdom of heaven given to the faithful in the thrice blessed name. In addition to all these John affirms, and these three are one, okay? Again, coming in very early from some church fathers. Gregory of Nazianzus, between 329 and 390 is when he lived, and this comes from Oration 45, the second oration on Easter. But if we are to be released in accordance with our desire and be received into the heavenly tabernacle, there too it may be we shall offer you acceptable sacrifices upon your altar, to Father and Word and Holy Ghost. For to you belongs all glory and honor and might, world without end. Amen. This is the English translation at New Advent. So Ignatius of Antioch in the mid-fourth century in the epistle of Ignatius to the Philadelphians says, uh, a long quote, rather long quote here, but it says, I have confidence of you in the Lord and ye will be of no other mind. Wherefore I write boldly to your love, which is worthy of God, and exhort you to have but one faith and one kind of preaching and one Eucharist. For there is one flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood, which was shed for us is one. One loaf also is broken to all and one cup is distributed among them all. There is but one altar for the whole church and one bishop with the presbytery and deacons, my fellow servants, since also, now note this, there is but one unbegotten being, God, even the Father, and only one only begotten Son, God, the Word, and man, and one comforter, the Spirit of truth, and also one preaching, and one faith, and one baptism, and one church, which the holy apostles established from one end of the earth to the other by the blood of Christ, and by their own sweat and toil. It behooves you also, therefore, as a peculiar people and a holy nation, to perform all things with harmony in Christ. Again, from the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, uh, edited by Alexander Roberts and James Donaldson. So here's what Jerome says between 347 and 420. Again, just as these are properly understood and so translated faithfully by interpreters into Latin without leaving ambiguity for the readers, nor follow or allowing the variety of genres in conflict, especially in that text where we read the unity of the Trinity is placed in the first letter of John, where much error has occurred at the hands of unfaithful translators, contrary to the truth of faith, who have kept just the three words, water, blood, and spirit in this edition, omitting mention of the Father, Word, and Spirit, which uh, in which especially the Catholic faith is strengthened and the unity of substance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is attested. So you can see what his view is on this. 
very much pointing to now just to re remind you of what he's getting at right here he's going to this part of the verse that you see here in kjv the part of the verse that's been omitted in other translations like the esv again see where it's in yellow in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one okay so there is a little bit coming out of the arian controversy and uh, there was this is based on a person who was called arius who lived between 256 and 336. And this occurred around the fourth, uh, third and fourth centuries. So Arius believed the son came into existence through the will of the father and had a beginning and therefore was not eternal. But of course, in John 1, 1, we know in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Okay. He didn't have a beginning. He's always existed. He was there already. Athanasius disagreed with him, believing God became human and the divine nature of Jesus was identical to that of the Father. So this led to Constantine's Nicene Council, which formulated the Nicene Creed. Jesus is eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. The Council of Arminium uh, tried to reverse Nicaea in 359. Emperor Theodosius, between 347 and 395, convened the council at Constantinople, or the Second Ecumenical Council, and reaffirmed the Nicene Creed. Other disagreements followed in the next centuries, but Arianism, fortunately, ended up collapsing. So who wrote the Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus? These are really similar, interestingly. According to Eusebius of Caesarea's Ecclesiastical History, the emperor Constantine ordered 50 copies of the Bible to be made. Many scholars believe that two of the copies were the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, which were based on the Hexapla or the Bible of Origen. Jerome indicated that two scribes were responsible for copying the manuscripts, Acacius, who is a bishop and pupil of Eusebius of Caesarea, and Eusodius. They were leaders in the Arian party, okay? Remember that these people who may have copied the two codices that were used for the critical text were leaders in the Arian party that had these wrong beliefs about Jesus. Eusebius was an admirer of Origen, by the way. And Origen, just in case you don't know, was a universalist and friend of Jerome. This type of Christianity was not present in Syria, northern Italy, southern France, and Great Britain, which used the Peshitta or the Syrian text and Latin texts, according to Wilkinson, 2015, in Our Authorized Bible Vindicated. Colossians 1.14, here's where this also makes a difference. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The ESV doesn't include through his blood. Mark 11.26, ESV doesn't say this verse. This is not in the ESV. It says, but if ye do not forgive, neither your father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Luke 4, 8, KGB, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Now in the ESV, strangely enough, the get thee behind me, Satan, is not there. Isn't that a little strange? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> uh, Matthew 23, 14, not in the ESV, but it's in the KJV. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a preference make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Luke 25, I'm sorry, 23, 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comes into thy kingdom. Recall, this is from the thief who was next to Jesus on the cross. Notice that he, he speaks to Jesus and he references him as Lord. Okay, the ESV removed the word Lord. Just says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mark 14, 24, and you can cross-reference this with Matthew 26, 28. The KGV says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. And the ESV, strangely enough, omitted the new. It's just, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for man. Mark 2, 17. Uh, the they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, the ESV doesn't have to repentance. It just says, but sinners. It's calling on us to repent. 
And Jesus answered him in Mark, Matthew 4, 4, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In the KJV, the ESV got rid of that. We don't have, but by every word of God. Okay. Now, remember again, going back to the tenets or these core beliefs of the critical text authors. One of them was to omit uh, what they considered additional words. They felt that the scribes had just added on additional words. So they took the idea that you should omit those words. But notice how important these words are and how this could affect meaning very seriously. Here's another one, Matthew 5, 22. In the ESV, it says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. The NIV is kind of similar. Anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Now, here's what the KJV says, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Notice that the other two don't say anything about without a cause. It makes it sound like it's kind of an arbitrary thing. We're supposed to just be angry with our brother or sister, but the KJV makes it quite explicit. It has to be for a cause. You can't be angry with somebody just out of the blue for no reason. That wouldn't be a just move, okay? The just move is if you have a cause to be angry. Here's some more translations. The KJV in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Here's what the ESV says. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Okay, the NIV. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Notice what's going on here. The KJV makes it quite explicit that the love of money is the root of all evil. Meaning there's no other root of all evil. Also, it's of all evil, not of all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil might exclude certain kinds of evil, okay? It could be all kinds of evil. And I mean, it could it, it could be something that doesn't very specifically point to it being all evil, everything. And all kinds of evils. Okay, so here's where this really gets quite important. Look at John 3.16. Here is one of the most serious and, and important testimonies. So in the KJV, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, that doesn't come across quite the same in the ESV. Remember Arianism? Remember how they don't believe that Jesus is the only begotten son? They just believe that he was created? Well, that goes in line with this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It doesn't give us any sort of implication of an eternal existence. So here's why deviations matter. And this is my conclusion slide. This is why this really matters. You're going to notice from all of those different verses that I gave to you, some of these items, they attempt to remove references to the Trinity, which we saw in the Johannine comment. And Jesus is as part of three in one. Okay. They attempt to reduce references that demonstrate Jesus's divinity, omniscience, sacrifice, power, eternity, righteousness, justice, and promise of a new covenant. They attempt to reduce our need to seek only Jesus for our salvation and the believer's baptism, the importance of the believer's baptism. They attempt to reduce references to the severity and eternal consequences of our sins and our need to repent. They attempt to reduce references to Jesus's power over Satan. These all boil down to Satan's first words. Did God really say that? So I'm going to come back over to the, the, the chat right now. Just want to say hi to people who are here. I really appreciate you guys coming in and listening to this. It's taken a while for me to gather this information, and I find it super fascinating. But the bottom line that I would say is we need to try to figure out what the original text said. We don't have the original writings. All we have are copies of it. But fortunately, we've got a wealth of information of the New Testament, about 5,800 New Testament Greek copies, Greek manuscripts very early on, okay? Some people have relied on two fourth century manuscripts, and a lot of that stems from the beliefs of Westcott and Hort in the 19th century. However, as I've demonstrated today, a lot of the assumptions that Westcott and Hort made are untrue, given some current scholarship and what we've learned about either being accidental works and accidental omissions from the scribes to being intentional uh, additions which is what is posited by people such as Westcott and Hort. 
they posited that the scribes intentionally added certain verses and certain words. But the scholarship, numerous scholarship, aside from what I even quoted, because of course we've got ex one example that I showed you of a person who wrote a dissertation on this, this particular topic. So the bottom line is I would say when you're trying to figure out exactly what the truth is, look at as much information as you can and try to be true to the word and to understand what Jesus would want uh, us to know about him. He wants us to know that he's, uh, he's in the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Johannine comma is something that should be included and all that kind of good stuff. So I hope that you guys enjoy this today. Please like and subscribe and do come again. And just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Thank you so much. So you guys have a great day. I want to say thank you to, I'm just going to go back and name people I see in the chat. Thank you, sister. It says uh, from Timothy. Thank you, Timothy. He said good stuff. Appreciate that. Uh, Theophilus 09 says Trinitarian references in 1 John chapters 5 and Matthew chapter 28 were only in MSS copied after 3. 50. Okay, well, you actually might want to go back and listen to the rest of this video because I have included a number of early church fathers far before that who made specific references to three and one that does reflect what's written in the Johannine comment. Doki Doki, great to see you. Yes, the uh, JW, the Jehovah Witness Bible, unfortunately, they're trying to take away Jesus's divinity. And we see plenty of evidence. In the beginning was a word and the word was with God and the word was God. And Jesus as the word. And again, that goes back to that comma. Uh, Harry Stark is also here. So Jehovah's Witnesses have their own translation. That's so true. Uh, and so uh, doki doki, Harry Stark. I just say hi to all of you. I'm just kind of flipping through here. Jason Lockery, also good to see you. And it was good to see Michael Wilson. He's a good friend of mine on Twitter. And uh, just wonderful. Salvific duty started off here. So I hope you, everybody has a great day. If you're interested in coming on my channel sometime or you're interested in a particular topic that you think I should cover or you'd like to see a debate or you'd like to be in a debate, I host those too. So please come by. Feel free to come by. Please like, subscribe, and do come again. Have a great day. Bye-bye.